All right, Roman, do you want to tell us a bit about yourself and how you got to where you are today? Ciao, Alex. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I originally and always, you know, when I was 14, 15, you know, years old, worked in restaurants in the summer. You know, we all need to, uh, to get at some point to get our own cash and not ask mommy and daddy for it. So, you know, started to work in a little restaurant, you know, in the little town where I was living in the southwest of France, north of Bordeaux. Uh, nothing much going on over there, you know, but you had this couple of restaurants, one of them uh, was owned by a former two Michelin star chef uh, based out of London, British. Uh, so I was very lucky to to learn from the from day one, you know, the, the right way, I think. And so I did this, but all I wanted to do was to become a doctor. So I went to med school, went to oh, med wow. school and uh, started to, to play uh, golf at the same time. If you ask my parents, you know, I ended up, you know, I think studying golf and with a side, you know, study of medicine more than the other way around. And so it led to, uh, you know, me not really being in the best position after two years and, and, and having to, uh, to drop out after failing the second year. And so yeah. and I went back, you know, to mom and daddy for four months, uh, worked again in one of these restaurants in the town I was living in with my parents. I was 19 years old at the time. Uh, and so I worked for four months in that restaurant and I signed a contract to play golf in, in the UK. And so I went, I moved to the UK oh, wow. and, uh, was supposed to be there for kind of six months. So when I was there for six months, you know, every morning I would practice golf and then, you know, to get some money, I would work in the evening in a little hotel restaurant, four star hotel in, uh, in the Southwest of London in Richmond. And, yeah. uh, this is for a little bit. And then six months passed, 10 months passed. Uh, still in London, you know, no kind of desire to uh, to go back. It was the first time for me to kind of leave home, you know, and uh, in that way, and it felt really good, you know, and you either go, you leave, you hate it, or you you love it, and then, you know, 15 years later, you're still gone. Um, yeah, yeah. So I moved to central really London, nice. and I, uh, right, exactly, yeah. I moved to, to central London, and I started to, uh, to, to work into uh, upscale dining restaurants. Uh, one of yep. them being Galvin at Windows. And then you know, within, uh, after three, four months after I started, we uh, we won our first time. And then from here on, you know, I really learned about structure. And so did four years in London, long story short, I ended up, you know, falling into the industry and liking it. Like a lot of people yep. in the end, you know, I kind of, you, you, you stick through it and, and then you find the, the amazing fun. And, and food and wine is a way better medicine than any other medicines you'll have, I think, in life, if you, with moderation, <laughs> you know, so... I oh, realized good, that I think it was good probably, food and good wine. Correct. The best therapy was that. And I think, you know, so treat people ahead of, you know, them going to the doctor and, and make them have a good time. And so after a little bit of time and some was in the UK, got a job offer in Dubai, spent three years in Dubai with Jumeirah as a portrait yeah. Arab. And then uh, met Chef Jean George at the time there, who was opening. Uh, him and I had a yeah. conversation about a job with him, which I declined. We connected, we stay in touch. And then fast forward, six months later, I was uh, starting my visa process and moved to the U.S. And I, I worked with Jean-Georges for seven years as a general manager of the Mercer to begin with and ended up being the vice president yep. of operations and uh, opening 22 restaurants with him. Uh, and had a, uh, an experience with 11 Madison Park at Make It Nice and, and now with, with Aman. And so Aman today here with the Aman New York, um, overseeing multiple hotels and food and beverage, you know, uh, for, uh, for the group and, and preparing the, uh, the, the future and the launch pad for, for the growth of the company. So that's, that's where that's we awesome. are today. That's how you got there. Yeah. Yeah, no, man, it's cool. I mean, I actually was in Southwest France one month ago, so I was in a town really called nice Yeah, I was in where? Osh. <laughs> <laughs> it's you know, all oceans? the good food and all the good wine over there. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Like you've got all your duck, you've got all your wine. You've yeah, got fish, you've got lots surfing. of fun. <laughs> it's it's a pretty good lifestyle. You know, it's a pretty a good, good lifestyle. Quiet life. Good yeah. quiet life. But the two of us are in New York now. You know, <laughs> New York. That's you know, and we are like you know in the cold and in the head. But that's great. I think you know. I think through this and what 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 we do in this environment. You've got to have multiple paths crossing, and, and, and New York is perfect for that. Perfect for that, exactly. And so, I guess um, the first question I probably want to ask you is like, you know, you're such an experienced, seasoned like operator. I mean, just looking at your background, the way you tell your background, it's so internationally like diverse. You know, you've kind of been in such high end, high pressure environments. And I guess the question I have for you is like, 
what do you see are like your sort of major roadblocks in your role today? Like Tim, uh, like that are in the way of, you know, you making a full success. Like what are the kind of things that are holding you back? Uh, it's a question I think you hear a lot today, but I think you, you hear a lot about hiring and staffing. Yep. So that's a technical component. But I think for me, I love to always say, you know, there was a great article by Peter Hoffman uh, in August 2021, I think, uh, in the New York Times. Uh, and the, the title of the, uh, the article was Restaurants Will Never Be the Same, period. They should not be. And, uh, and that, for me, was, you know, exactly what is the concern and the challenge of today and the opportunity, I call it, of today. Uh, yeah. And uh, because the hiring, the staffing, is a result of that. And I think the first thing we were all trying to do, you know, the first year or two of COVID was, you know, let's go back to our 2019 numbers. Let's go back to our 2019 staffing. Just trying to go back to who we were instead of establishing the new model. I think, you know, the hospitality industry since 2015, 2017, through multiple, you know, inflation, human resources, uh, uh, flips, which were the right one, they were just should have been that way a long time ago. It's not 1999, and we don't talk anymore to an employee in a walk in freezer, you know, to, to let them know about what, what was wrong. But I think it is finding the balance between what are the employers looking to yeah. do and what are the employees looking to, to do, right? And within the market, specifically in the US, I think this environment, the hospitality environment, has always been. A, for, for most people, a short stop and experience towards yeah. something else, right? A launch pad for themselves, for their own career. Uh, meanwhile, in Western Europe, it is, you know, a very different uh, vision toward that, that, that environment, you know, where, where people are looking at it from a, as a craft and as something they want to build their career yeah. in. And so I think what, what you see is that... Um, for me, it's the biggest challenge is just finding the new routine, the new model that's going to make hospitality yeah. an accessible and exciting career for people and not just a side job yeah. to pay rent while you're going to your, your, your casting, you know? And so, yeah, the end, I think for me, this is where the, the, the challenge is for sure is going to be, you know, staffing is going to be the hiring is going to be the retaining. I think people apply for jobs yeah. and companies, but they stay and they, they, you retain them because of people. Uh, but the answer to this is no it's so much more deep than just the hourly yeah. rate and uh, the scheduling component it's it's really like there's got to be a different purpose and, and for me that's that's where the challenge but the opportunity for me is is like finding this new model and i think a lot of people a lot of talented groups uh, are working on it but nobody has yet find the answer to that and and the answer yeah, to that definitely. is also partially you know um depending on the consumer the consumer has to change a little bit in order for us to be able to successfully, you know, uh, interesting. make the new way, you know, for the future of the you industry. Know, you, it's interesting you say that because I've heard that from people that the consumer hasn't changed, but the industry has kind of changed. And so the expectations of consumers are almost like 2019 kind of expectations and the business model for lots of hospitality has now changed since. Do you like what are kind of some of the things that you've seen that like you see that consumers kind of have not either changed or they kind of stayed where they are, but the hotels have had to evolve or the resorts have had to evolve? Like what like what is there anything mm -hmm. that kind of comes to mind there? Totally. I mean, like the burger you eat today and the burger you eat in 2019, they're both the same. You know, just the burger you eat today costs eight dollars more than it used to cost yeah. four years ago. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, a burger was costing between 15 and 20 bucks in a restaurant in, in 2019. It's, you know, probably between 25 and 30 today. Uh, what really changed in it? Nothing, you know. Uh, what changes is probably that actually it takes, you know, 12 to 15 minutes to get to your table instead of eight to 10 minutes before because, well, you've got a few less hands in your kitchen, you know, and the hands you yeah. have are people that had to be trained over the last three years with no experience before because the talent that had been, you know, until COVID, you know, unfortunately left and is not returning to the industry. And so yep. I always refer to it as, you know, in terms of leadership and, and staff, like the leadership team that we, you have in the industry now, I call them the, uh, the, the bridge, the bridge generation of leadership because they were 
they were told by people uh, that were, you know, talking to you in the freezer to tell you that you did wrong, yeah. you know, and you one of, you know, one person was probably coming back with a bruise. Um, <laughs> and they are asked, so that's how they were told. So therefore that's who they are, right? Meanwhile, since 2015, 2017, uh, you're clearly, um, you know, you know, HR is a, is a true, um, part of a, 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 an hospitality organization, you know, with a true responsibility yeah. rather than an advisor and a protector of the employer as it, you know, which is, you know, the right things. So perhaps the transition was correct, I think. And, and now you're looking at those leaders having to connect with a, a, an employee that when you say, let's put the folks this way, they're like, but why? Right? Yeah. And they're asking, they want to understand the purpose. They want to understand the reasoning. They want to connect with it. And uh, the way we told was like, you do it to keep your job, right? You don't do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do it to keep your job. Otherwise, next person in line is going to take your job. And, and that's the way. And, you know, keep quiet, you know? So you having those people having to lead a team that is treating them so differently than the way they were treating their own boss 20 years, 15, 20 years yeah. ago. Uh, and nobody ever told them how to respond to somebody that's asking a why for every step of the way. Uh, and there's nothing wrong about asking why, but it is much more time consuming. And it is also, you have to have an answer that makes sense, that has a purpose and that you have, uh, you are consistent with to ensure that everybody in your team is, is, is on the same page. And so these are the, the, one of the challenges, you know, as an employer, but as a consumer, I think the consumer also through this, you know, reconnected a lot with themselves and the true yeah. surrounding that they had during COVID. They got a lot more knowledgeable about the industry and about what we do. Uh, they, they read a lot more. The critics, I think, have gone from uh, just people that take down restaurants to actually, you know, often, you know, what you were saying earlier on, you know, is the opinion doesn't matter to everybody, but it's relevant, right? And yeah. so people, I think, pay attention to this. And, and, and through that messaging, kind of have an opinion that is a lot more relevant to also operators. And so, so the truth is, is like, how do you justify to somebody um, the price of the burger that is becoming, you know, really expensive or your slice of pizza without having to go through okay, well, the price of my meat is more expensive. The price of my labor is more expensive. Uh, I'm opening less late than I used to because yep. nobody wants to go out past 10 p.m. anymore. And the 6 p.m. is a new 8 p.m. Uh, because it doesn't matter to the guests, you know, what you're going through, right? Uh, especially in a model in the U.S. where you make the guests pay partially for your employees, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very different. So how, what do you do in your restaurant in your establishment in your hotel to justify um this price increase when the person becomes more knowledgeable about what you do you don't get your lid on change in the bedroom every single day anymore you don't get your bathroom tables changed every single day anymore uh and uh and the choices on the menu are a little bit more reduced because the manpower is more limited the supply chain is also yeah. still challenged so it's it's the things the article i mentioned is it's Say something I have it really open true. here. You, you'll see it's, it's really such a good one. Uh, and I think the big cities in the U.S. are very specific for that. And the market in the U.S. is very specific. But, you know, I think New Yorkers specifically, uh, they don't dine in restaurants. The restaurants are the kitchen. How many New Yorkers have never cooked in their apartments, right? You know? Yeah. Well, <laughs> we all know. I mean, I see you that. Know? I mean, it's right? a tiny little kitchen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. So, you know, the costs, you know, add up. You know, the, I love this Instagram post says, you know, your bank account is basically a um, tracking a way for you to track the restaurants you ate at. You know, that's basically yeah. it. You know, it's a, it's an, uh, it's a list of recommendations of restaurants. Uh, so when you go in Europe, you go to the restaurant to have an experience and a dinner. And so it's really interesting to see both and both are, are equally challenged. So I think it's just yeah. going to be a bit of a bit in between where Europeans are a little bit more excited to go out to the restaurant again and, and just cope up, you know, with uh, an average check that is definitely way higher and, and a label that is way less expensive, but they're going to get there. They just need a bit of time. 
And then in the US, yeah. we're reestablishing that restaurants should not be a way of life, breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day, you know? Yeah. And so that it allows people to really look at their dinner in a restaurant very differently than they, they, they do Monday through Sunday, seven days a week. And um, it requires both to appreciate what restaurants are really about and that you come to a restaurant to experience the talent of a, a chef, a cook, a manager, a server, uh, and a menu that comes all together. But the restaurant's purpose is not to be your dining room, you know, technically. Yeah. So oh, that, and yeah, do you feel like you've seen that, that pe like people's like respect for the restaurant has kind of changed in, when I say I respect, mean, I don't mean like negatively. I mean mm -hmm. like the way they approach what was versus now in terms of the dining experience as, yeah, I, I'm trying to yeah. <laughs> say it in such a I way. I think everybody became negative. an expert. You know, everybody became yeah, an yeah. expert, right? Everybody became an expert in food and wine. Everybody during COVID did, did some class. Everybody <laughs> had to cook. You just, either you cooked or you didn't eat, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, then, yeah. Uh, you know, everybody read a little bit about wine. Everybody did a little course, which is fantastic. That's what that's, he said. It's great, you know, because, you know, how many times also on the, on the flip side you had, you know, hospitality industries like taking advantage, right? And yeah. uh, talking to like your nobody and they're just, you know, oh yeah, you're going to have a great time. I give you a great uh, full body one here is your Pinot Noir. And be like, yes, absolutely. And later on, you just find out that Pinot Noir is, you know, probably going to be on the lighter side. Um, I think it's um, everybody has an opinion. Everybody is the only little chef or the only little, you know, study yeah. expert, right? And if it was so easy to do it, well, a lot of people more would, would do it. I think they are more closing restaurants now than they are opening restaurants, which I think is a trend that flipped. It used to be the other way around. Yeah. Um, and so, and everybody wants to, to have their opinion valued. You know, everybody wants to feel at the table like they bring something to you, right? Everybody is louder than they used to be, right? And so I think is, in, while this happens also, we have a workforce that is a lot more sensitive to feedback and emotional. And uh, you can manage it, you know, on the employer side, but yeah. how do you manage it um, when the guest comes at you that way? Right when people yeah. are coming in, letting you know very openly that, you know, in uh, in a nice way that you're not good at what you do, and when you come in and you're trying your hardest, you know, and yeah. and uh, so that's there's so much balance to to do, and I think it's a big marketing campaign that has to be done yeah. in the hospitality industry that says there is a path for it. You know, there is an opportunity. There is something exciting. You can make money out of it. You don't have to work 15 hours a day, six days a week. There is a path for that. We have to have employees that really are going to be looking inward into really yeah. building a restaurant that is also built around the employees. So nobody wants to take a subway at one in the morning, right? So have your hours of operations reflect that. Yeah. Have your models reflect this, but also have an employee that is going to be really having a strong sense of integrity towards what they do. And it's going to know that ultimately there's so many opportunities for everybody to work and to dine in restaurants that we are in the business of making people happy, but we're not in the business of making everybody happy. And because of that, you've got to find a balance for your team to make sure yeah. that you draw the line on where your concept or where, you know, the flexibility goes to, because you have to be flexible, you know, that's, you know, um, but the sentence, the, the, the customer is always right, is, is, is not relevant anymore, I think. And the sentence, yeah. uh, everybody is replaceable, that should be banned because not everybody is replaceable. And, and if you have that mindset, you're going to be struggling for a long time and, and it's just not a great work environment. So I think there needs to be a massive, I'd love if one day there could be a, a, an international kind of conversation going around that where we are able to look at the positioning of employers and employees within yep. the industry and, and also look at the cohesiveness uh, between the front and the back of the house, you know, the service and the culinary to ensure that both are feeling the same way. You know, I think there is things that needs to be done uh, uh, on, uh, on a legal level towards laws and regulations towards pay that needs yeah. to be adjusted so that you are rewarded equally 
you know, to work in the kitchen or to work in service because you didn't do it because yeah. of you didn't because you felt more comfortable uh, on one side or the other. One is more comfortable in front of a guest in an environment that's temperature control in the dining room. One is less comfortable in front of a guest, prefers to cook, but is working, you know, 10 hours a day on a 90 degrees hotline, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's not because they couldn't do one or the other, it's just because they wanted to, right? And so therefore the incentive towards that should be equally, uh, I think, supported. And um, and and uh, and guests should be more educated on how it actually works, how the tipping system works, and who gets what, and how is it distributed, so that we could come in to a much more exciting and 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 enticing and competitive yeah. work environment in hospitality industry. That's something I'd love for 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 one day for somebody myself is one of the goals is like being able to create. Uh, enough relevance to be able to have access to a conversation to challenge the current model yeah. and ultimately change it. Oh man, I mean, this has been fantastic. I know that we're at a race yet time. I feel like I could just listen to you for like an hour easily. Um, I'm going to pause the recording uh, just because I just want to say something to you uh, for one sec. We're at your time. Unless you can keep going. I mean, no, I, mean, I think I we can have. Let me check quickly. I have. Yeah, I have a meeting now that started four minutes ago. I can't take another six minutes and then go off, but yeah, yeah, we got six minutes. Oh, we got six minutes. Okay, great. Um, I was just going to say, it's like, you know, it's interesting you talk about, you know, like the employment law itself. It's interesting you talk about like, you know, like tipping culture and how that basically subsidizes the income for a lot of the employees and making it enticing for people to come work here in the first place. You know, I hear that a lot from restaurant owner operators from like you know on a corporate level on like an actual restaurant like hands-on level hear that from hotels like you know because i know you're you guys have um hotels as well and it's like i hear like night managers the amount of people who spoke to me about night managers and how basically it's impossible to find those people now <laughs> it's like finding that person who's a team who's such a team player because it's a, such a huge amount of trust like I never thought about it in a way before, but like if your flight's delayed and you come in at three o'clock in the morning and you've got a baby, that night manager is the face of your business, you know? It. And it's like finding that person. And I guess, you know, for you, uh, like how do you look for that kind of je ne sais quoi, as they say? <laughs> I think for the Americans that listen to this, that this is a French phrase. <laughs> There's going to be translation <laughs> happening and coming up on the side of the screen in a minute. Totally. Uh, like we got Thierry Henry in here to explain it, you know. That's it. It's the, trans uh, the French, the Irish, uh, everything together is like, we're like, okay, next. Uh, <laughs> when we come to the hospitality industry at the same time, that's great. That's exactly what it is, you know, a melting pot. Yep. Um, and um, I think transparency is the answer to, to what you're saying. I think. People are willing. I think a lot of people say, oh, nobody wants to work hard anymore. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to do this well. You know, if you had a chance, if I had the chance to like, you know, back 15 years ago, 16 years ago, when I really dived into this industry full time or 20 years ago when I was carrying my first plate, would I wanted to do it differently if I could have and make the same money? The answer is, of course, who doesn't want to do that? Who doesn't want to make it easier for themselves and, and keep, this, keep the same amount of income? Um, but you have to have a true clear path of, of the opportunities that lies ahead for somebody in some of the tough positions. You know, I think you talk about the night person. I talk about the closing manager, you know, for me, like in, in the, the, the late shift in engineering in security and in, in service industry in restaurants or hotels, the one that is going to be, you know, dealing with your late night guests. You know, the one that's going to be dealing with the staff that wants to go home when the restaurant is not ready to close. So I was going to be dealing with the drunk person, you know, the, 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 on, the, on the subway on the ride home, which is the last thing you want to do when you're like, you're just listening to your music. You're like, you want to chill and wine. And then you've got that person in your face, you know. And also the fact that before that person gets to the subway, the one that's going to be at 11 p.m. waiting for yeah. that night person to show up. Because if they know really well that if that night person doesn't show up, Bonjour, you know, it's <laughs> you, you know, it's you, yeah, yeah. It's anxiety, it's stress, right? But as an employer, it, it people will show up. 
you know, you can't, you know, you can't talk for the, you know, one percent of employees that are going to be dismissive and it's going to be like calling yeah. out because you know they made enough money on Friday and on their paycheck and they call out for the weekend to go to the Hamptons. You can't talk about them because they're not everybody, right? Yeah. Um, but if you do the right things as an employer, if you provide an environment where people feel supported and excited to be in, where they're learning, because people say, oh, that you can't, you can't coach anybody anymore. You can't hold them accountable. Like you can't hold them accountable. Number one, did you tell them what you wanted precisely and clearly? Yep. Second of all, did you coach them from the moment that you diverted or they diverted, right? Or did you wait for the fifth time? You're like, I'm enough, enough of that. We've done this five times. No, you got to be consistent, you know, and I think people will be there and they will show up and they will show up for the 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. shifts to 6 a.m. shifts. Um, if they have that, because but it needs to be integrated in, yeah. in, in your model. And then that person that works for me overnight, you know, for the one that wants to do it as a stepping stone, you need to talk to them openly and you need to be honest and you need to be, you know, really speaking the truth genuinely of, of what their growth plan is about, you know? Yep. And you have to have a timeline. The growth plan can cannot be like, oh, I think within one year or six months, you'll be able to do this. But, you know, it depends if I can replace you. The, the, the responsibility but, of replacing that person is not on them, it's on you, right? And that person's know, performance is going to be rewarded. You know, you say that like you met uh, Jean-Georges mm-hmm. and you were like, oh, I'm not ready to join you yet. And then you kind of had a bit of a, a dalliance and then you joined him, okay? My question to you is he saw something in you and so it was like, okay, I want you to come and you come to the next level. So he saw an intangible in you. Do you, what intangibles do you look for, for the person that you can do that to? More and more, I look less and less at the resumes in the interview. Okay. Yeah. You know, and, and when, when you know, you know, you know, you, you're going to yeah. say hello to you. You sit down in a restaurant, you look up, your server comes and says hi. By the time they're gone and they just took your water orders and gave you the menus, you know. You know if it's going to be a long night or not. You know if you want to like, can I have a different server? Or oh, this is going to be fun, you know? Yeah. And when you sit in an interview, it's the same thing, right? I think you've got to be much more open, even in the five-star industry, tattoos and everything. Like, you've got to be open. Like, it's 2023. Like, if you want to be, you know, a business that's going to be relevant in 10, 20 years from now, and, and you have an issue with this, then you need to hope yeah. that somebody's going to build a time traveling machine and you can go back in 1999 uh because that's going to be gone and it's it's not bad that it is you know and there's going to be a market for this but it's diminishing um and so i think the, the idea and what you look for is really like okay do i want that person do i do i want to wake up every day and be excited to get to work to work with that person you yeah. know the skills and everything are going to be there you know is a the the, the the challenge of the workforce of today is yes, they have very limited experience compared to who we used to find, but that's an opportunity because they are sponges. The yeah. more you hire people with experience, the more they're going to say, "Oh, when I was there, I used to do that," you know, and I was there for twenty years, and they they, they, they knew so well what they were doing. They were X Y Z. They were the best. But instead of getting a sponge, that's going to be like, "Okay, can you show me?" Yeah, you show them once, twice, three times. They got it. They don't have a point of reference. They're like babies. They're going to be like excited, right? As yeah. far as you provide them with that excitement. So to me, I think this is what it is. Like, can I mold that person? But am I excited to, you know, talk with this person? Am I feeling a connection? You know, like treat it like you go on a first date. <laughs> I mean, you know it right away. Do totally. you have an appetizer or do you want to have a three course meal? You know, yeah. well, you're going to know five <laughs> minutes in, right? It's, it's exactly the same. Thing, Absolutely. You know? I mean, I mean, I mean fair. I mean, you kind of can tell basically immediately. Um, yeah, it's interesting, man. I mean, this has been phenomenal, and I have had such a great time chatting with you. This is, Same. I mean, you, been fantastic. 